Welcome to the Brown County Hour. Coming to you from the legendary hills of Brown, where the plum purple haze, the one nature herself drapes over the hills and hollers, inspires local characters, artists, and nature lovers. It's as though the hills themselves conspire to create a beauty and culture in the heart of Indiana. Sit for a spell and hear the music. Tall tales. True stories. And current goings on. Brought to you by folks who still know how to sit by a fire in winter. And swim buck naked in summer. Welcome to episode 80 of the Brown County Hour. This is Vera Grubbs. And Dave Seastrom. This month, we're pleased to present Chris Dollar as our musical guest. And we'll listen to some of his music that was recorded live in our studio and a selection from his CDs, Away Away, and Soundscapes for the Clawhammer Banjo. Jim Eagleman shares his love of apples. Bob Curlin shares some information about the Brown County Playhouse, and we'll continue our interview with the new CRC director, Christy Reitzman. Jennifer Buby talks about being Brown County Fair Queen. Chuck Will shares his truck essay, and Dave Seastrom has a few words about reincarnation. The show begins with Chuck's interview with Chris Dollar. Jim Eagleman has a few words about a favorite seasonal treat, apples. And we'll close the first segment with Chris Dollar's tune, Away, Away. This is Chuck Wills along with Rick Fettig, and our musical guest for the evening is Chris Dollar. You have probably heard of him from the John Hartford Festival and uh, his old band, New Old Cavalry. He is the most recent member of the Hen House Prowlers. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Chuck. Yeah, welcome. You are a bluegrass musician, and I, I see the word thrown around quite a bit, new grass versus bluegrass. <laughs> where, where do you fit in the spectrum? Oh, geez, I don't know if anyone fits anywhere in the spectrum these days. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, it's, um, I guess, you know, my, my heart lies in traditional bluegrass, but uh, I don't really play traditional bluegrass. Okay. It's, it's more my, my inspiration to, to grow on. Okay, very good. <laughs> I, I noticed on one of the websites it mentioned Greengrass Acousticana. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we like uh, mashing up words in the bluegrass community. <laughs> Very good. Well, uh, we had spoken earlier, and you said that you were one of the new members of the Hen House Prowlers. That's Why don't right. you tell us a little bit about them? Well, uh, I, I joined that band in February, and they've been a band for about 14 going on 15 years. Ben and John, the banjo and uh, bass player, are the original members. They've grown this on their own, and they've had a lot of amazing players come in and out, and uh, it's it's been a joy trying to, to fill some of the shoes that have come through. But uh, they, they also, in the last two years, started a nonprofit called the Bluegrass Ambassadors, and what they do is they've been using a lot of their experiences from work with the State Department, uh, which has sent them to over, I think, 25 countries across the globe. So now what we're trying to do is get into schools and, you know, using bluegrass as a jumping off point, but teaching kids about folk music from around the world, because every country, every culture and community has their own type of folk music. Sure. So your band is really becoming a worldwide force. Yeah. <laughs> so how does a bluegrass band get connected with the State Department? They had to apply for it. It's a, It was a project that actually started many years ago called the Jazz Ambassadors, where we were sending our most famous musicians and most highly regarded musicians uh, around the world to, to play music. One of the key figures from that was Louis Armstrong. They actually sent um, all over and 
they they sent him over to Africa and uh, and East Asia and all all those places and you know we had jazz music as American music but they decided to broaden it to all music from America so the Prowlers applied for it they, I think they they got the call a few weeks later after sitting in a room of they they told me it was complete straight face diplomats sitting there and with no feedback whatsoever after they were done trying out and. Fortunately, they got the call and got the gig. So they've been to Saudi Arabia. They've been to Kenya, Uganda. This isn't through the State Department, but soon in November, we're going to the Czech Republic to do a a school program there. So how often would you get sent out on one of these missions? They would get sent out probably a couple times a year, and it was usually pretty fast on how it would come up. I think they got a call about two weeks before they were on a plane to Kyrgyzstan. Wow. (laughs) Amazing. <laughs> so do you shift gears, apparently? Yes, yeah. You, you, you have to be ready for it. And, you know, they've got a, the State Department's got a roster of people that can do it if you can't. But they always jump at the chance to do it. Yeah. <laughs> the Prowlers have definitely taken me places I've never been before. Right. I mean, after the, I think, the third show, we got on a plane and we're in Europe for five weeks and got to meet a lot of people and didn't understand a lot of the things that they were saying. But <laughs> <laughs> they didn't understand what I was saying, so it was, it was even. Yeah. Yeah. Well, music's a universal language. Yes, yeah, so. blue, exactly. Bluegrass yeah. translates. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, cool. And the band is based out of Chicago? The band's based out of Chicago. Um, John, bass player, is the only one who's originally from Chicago, but uh, Ben's been there forever, and uh, Kyle, the mandolin slash fiddle player, moved from Evergreen, Colorado, to come play in the band, and... I spend a lot of time on 65. (laughs) (laughs) Well, how did you get connected with them to begin with? Uh, It was actually from playing in the New Old Cavalry. We we played a couple shows with them. They actually played down in Bloomington. was the first time I met them at uh, Max's place. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we, we, you know, started up a conversation and kind of stayed in touch. And as time went on, you know, they had an opening when I was free and it, it worked out. You mentioned at the start of one of your songs that you lived in a van for a while with your wife and traveled around. So two questions. How far did you travel? But maybe more importantly, how did you convince your wife to travel <laughs> with you in a van? Uh, you know, it, it didn't take that much convincing, which was nice. We get along well. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> That's actually, good. Um, the CD here that I, that I brought, Away Away, the first song is the song that convinced her to go with me. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, so right. the me and my traveling gal is uh, the reflection of it. But uh, yeah, that that song helped. <laughs> okay. Is she a musician as well? <laughs> no, she's uh, she is an artist though. She's a painter. You are a singer, songwriter, guitar player, banjo player. Mm-hmm. So how long have you been playing? Uh, I've been in in like a musical mindset since I think I started playing trumpet. Would have been in sixth grade, uh, mm-hmm. and I got my guitar freshman year of high school. So you did like the school band thing? Yeah, that, did the school yeah. band. Right. Uh, had a lot of fun doing that. We spoke earlier that you and I hail from the same part of the state. That's right. <laughs> How do you get from a suburbia upbringing to being so interested in this traditional form of music? You know, it, it really, it started as kind of a, a response to what was going on in while I was in high school. Because when I was in high school, it was a lot of screamo rock kind of bands like that. And uh me and actually this guy, he got a banjo and I had a guitar and we thought that, oh, we'll be a shoe in because we're different. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I think our, our first set was 15 minutes long and we didn't have enough material to cover that. <laughs> so we had to come up with a few jokes in between that were kind of long, long jokes. <laughs> so it's grown a lot from there. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Oh, good. Nice. And so you transitioned to Bloomington? and uh, continued your musical pursuits? That's right. I, uh, I came down to Bloomington after high school to attend the Indiana University and uh, got my telecom degree, which I use every day. Okay. <laughs> <So> maybe not. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. <laughs> but, uh, okay. but yeah, so I, I, I stuck with the bluegrass and uh, really, really started to focus on it. Just after college was like, okay, well, is this going to be a hobby or am I actually going to try something here? Mm, decision uh, point. Yeah. Because a lot of what we were doing back in the day is what some would call parking lot picking. Having gained a, a great respect for traditional bluegrass has really advanced uh, what, what I've been able to do. Where does your solo music career fit in with the uh, Hen House Prowlers and everything else you want Around to do? the edges. <laughs> right now, pretty much whenever there's a spare moment, which okay. isn't very often. But uh, okay. but it's it's still fun. I, I get out and I play. There's a, I play over at the Crazy Horse every once in a while. Uh-huh. It was like a Sunday gig that they let me do every once in a while when I'm in town. 
Um, and I, I still write music. You know, not not everything that I write is necessarily a Prowler's tune or a mm-hmm. New Old Cavalry tune. You know, they just kind of sit on the back burner, and I have the way that I play it by myself and the way I might play it if it was a group setting. <laughs> sure. Chris, where can we find you online? Facebook is where, where we're the most active. The Henhouse Prowlers page or my page, I would point them to uh, bluegrassambassadors.org if they want to learn anything else about the nonprofit. I've got all my music is on Bandcamp. Okay. If, if you know that website. Sure. So just search for Chris Dollar on Bandcamp. Yeah. Well, Chris, I know that you played in Brown County recently. Where else will we be able to find you or Hen House Prowlers in the near future? Uh, this uh, December 12th, I believe, will be at the Mousetrap in Indianapolis. It's uh, 56 in Keystone. As for Bloomington, Nashville dates, we don't have anything on the books yet, but we had a great time playing at the Red Barn. I, I assume we'll be back. Yeah, I heard it was a great show, so uh, hopefully thanks. 2019. Yeah, I yeah. hope so. All right, Chris, well, thank you for coming in and speaking with us. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, sir. You can hear more songs from Chris Dollar recorded live in our studio on our website at browncountyhour.com. Hello, this is Jim Eagleman for Nature Ramblings, the FHB FM, the Brown County Hour. My tribute this time is about the apple from one of my favorite nature writers, John Burroughs. For Burroughs, sometimes called the dean of American nature writers, apples are the fruit of youth and of a young, strong America. People are bound together by the communal ties of harvest rituals. Not a little of the sunshine of our northern winters is surely wrapped up in the apple. How could we winter over without it? How is life sweetened by its mild acid? A cellar well filled with apples is more valuable than a chamber filled with flax and wool. Hope you enjoy these words from John Burroughs. The apple is the commonest and yet the most varied and beautiful of fruits. A dish of them is becoming to the center table in winter, as was the vase of flowers in summer. A bouquet of Spitzenbergs, Greenlings, and Northern Spires, and Cortlands. A rose when it blooms, the apple is a rose when it ripens. John knew it was in the rose family. It pleases every sense to which it can be addressed, the touch, the smell, the sight, the taste. And when it falls in the still October days, it pleases the air with a thunk. It is a call to a banquet. It is a signal that the feast is ready. The bow would fain hold it, but it can now assert its independence. It can now live a life of its own. Noble common fruit, best of men and most loved by him, following him like his dog or his cow wherever he goes. His homestead is not planted until you are planted. The apple, your roots intertwine with his Thriving best where he thrives best, loving the limestone and the frost, the plow and the pruning knife, you are indeed suggestive of hardy, cheerful industry and a healthy life in the open air. The boy is indeed the true apple eater and is not to be questioned how he came by the fruit with which his pockets are filled. It belongs to him and he may steal it if it cannot be had in any other way. In some countries, the custom remains of placing a rosy apple in the hand of the dead. They may find it when they enter paradise. In northern mythology, the giants eat apples to keep off old age. The apple is indeed the fruit of youth. As we grow old, we crave apples less. I don't know why. It is an ominous sign. When you are ashamed to be seen eating them on the street, when you carry them in your pocket and your hand not constantly finds its way to them, when your neighbor has apples and you have none, and you make no nocturnal visit to his orchard, when your basket lunch is filled without them and you can pass a winter's night by the fireside with not the thought of the fruit at your elbow, then be assured you are no longer a boy, either in heart or years." Nearly every farmhouse in the eastern and northern states has its setting or its background of apple trees. 
which generally date back to the first settlement of the farm. Indeed, the orchard, more than anything other common thing, tends to soften and humanize the country and give the place of which it is adjacent a settled domestic look. And in planning a homestead or in choosing a building site for the homestead, what a help it is to have a few old maternal apple trees nearby, regular old grandmothers who have seen trouble, who have been sad and glad enough through so many winters and summers, who have blossomed till the air about them is sweeter than elsewhere, and borne fruit till the grass beneath them has become thick and soft from human contact, and who have nourished robins and finches in their branches till they have a tender, brooding look. A tribute to the apple this fall day by John Burroughs. Hope you enjoyed it. Jim Eagleman, Nature Ramblings, WFHB, FM, the Brown County Hour. Thanks for listening.
Now we pause for station identification. You are listening to the Brown County Hour on Volunteer Powered Community Radio, WFHB, at 100.7 in Brown County, 91.3 and 98.1 in Bloomington, 106.3 at Ellettsville, and online at WFHB.org. We will begin this segment with a continuation of our interview with Christy Reitzman. Bob Curlin tells us what's going on with the Brown County Playhouse, and we'll hear the Chris Dollar tune, Me and My Traveling Gal. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce Christy Reitzman, who is returning to tell us all about the Ready School Grant, which she has worked on and is now going to take Brown County education in a whole new direction. Thanks for having me here tonight. It's good to be back with all of you. Well, the last time we talked to you, you were applying for this grant, and now you've actually got it. Absolutely. So tell us about the grant and how it's going to change things for students and people in Brown County. So now it is official. We have secured through the Regional Opportunity Initiative the $500,000 Ready Schools grant that we applied for. This was the year-long process that I talked with you about the last time, and now we are ready to roll with all of the initiatives within the district, uh, PK, preschool, through adult initiatives. And so things are already in motion as we speak to implement these initiatives and utilize that $500,000 for our community. I've been reading and rereading the uh, Democrat article, and it sounds like you have different things you want to do with this money. Would you like to outline some of those? Sure, I would love to. So we have built a, a system, a new system within Brown County Schools that outlines three pillars for success. Pillar number one, the ready student, preparing all of our students to be ready for whatever's next, ready for college, ready for career, whatever may come across their path, that they are ready for that. The second pillar that we've built is related to innovative teaching and learning. We know that our educators have to be prepared to teach students for those new jobs for the future, and so we are preparing them through various innovative teaching and learning experiences, as well as providing classroom spaces to integrate the new types of curriculum that we're bringing into the district. The final pillar that we'll be talking about is community and regional engagement. And that's where the Career Resource Center comes in as um, our educational hub here in this community. So there are multiple initiatives under each of those pillars that we will be implementing over the course of the next three years. This is a three-year, three-phased approach that will focus, like I said, on those three pillars of ready students, innovative teaching and learning, and community and regional engagement. I'm just a little bit confused by these. I guess it's an acronym, but uh, we had STEM and then we have STEAM. Yes, yes. So STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics, um, is the STEM acronym. But here in Brown County, we want to value our heritage and the arts, and we recognize the, the importance of the arts within our curriculum. So we are a STEAM district. They're, they're really interchangeable, except for the fact that we add arts into our curriculum as well and integrate that across. Well, I understand also there's going to be a vocational aspect to this. Absolutely. So we know that career and technical education is very important right now. There are lots of fields in the career technical world and jobs that are available to students that are requiring skills that students um, haven't necessarily always been learning within the classroom. And uh, we know that there are lots of students, groups of students who are not necessarily preparing to go to a four-year college, but have those career and technical skills or want to build those skills to be able to go out and to obtain those jobs that are in demand right now, requiring those kind of hands-on, on-the-job type skills. We know that there's a need for construction. We know there's a need for electrical workers. We know there are needs for steel workers. A lot of unions that we see here in Indiana are needing students to come out of high school and be prepared with some of those skills that they can utilize in on the job in, in new jobs. Absolutely. I mean, and I know that traditionally Brown County has had a really strong vocational area in terms of house building and construction. And the, sadly, that program has ended. Are you talking about re-upping that program or uh, including that in amongst the mix that you're working on? Or Well, vocational training has changed a bit in that we, um, we call it career technical training at this point. Our students, um, unfortunately, do not have the opportunity to take part in the building trades courses 
services that they used to here in Brown County on our property. But they still can engage in those courses by attending C4 over in Columbus. And yes, we are looking at bolstering our vocational opportunities within Brown County. The more opportunities we can provide for our students right here in Brown County and find teachers and instructors to teach those courses right here in Brown County, the easier it will be for our boys and girls to obtain those certifications and those skills needed in those vocational areas instead of perhaps having to travel to Columbus to obtain all of those. Now, there's going to be some kind of a business and industry aspect in the school itself. Absolutely. So establishing partnerships with business and industry is absolutely one of the key parts that falls under the community and regional engagement pillar. We are partnering with a variety of industries to come and speak to our students about careers, to talk to them about certifications and skills they will need for jobs. One example that I can give you right now is Eagle Manufacturing has been established at Brown County High School. This is a a manufacturing course for students at a variety of academic levels that will allow them to partner with industries around our region to come in and help support the students and teach them a variety of skills related to manufacturing. This just sounds so exciting, so wonderful, full of opportunities. So what's the first thing you're going to do? Well, the first thing that we did is as it was back this summer, actually, um, Eagle Manufacturing, the start of Eagle Manufacturing actually started last school year. And due to the funding, we were able to continue those efforts. And, and we had our grand opening the other evening. We're looking forward to an open house for all of the community and all of our regional partners in the spring. One of the next steps that we have is to continue the rebranding of the Career Resource Center as our education hub. And then also, we're in the process right now of preparing our teachers to teach some new curriculum. We have a new illustrative math curriculum that's going into the high school that's very hands-on for our students, and um, our teachers are learning that new curriculum right now. We're also training our elementary teachers to prepare our students for engineering, biomedical classes, and um, and manufacturing. So our educators are working very hard right now to learn lots of new curriculum and to get these initiatives rolling in the district. I'm sure this is going to have a tremendous impact on the community, and I very much appreciate your coming in to explain this program to us, and congratulations on pulling it off. Thank you. We appreciate that. Good to be here. It's my pleasure to introduce Bob Curlin, who is the chairman of the board of the Brown County Playhouse, and he's here this evening to tell us all about the Playhouse and some of the things they've been up to. Sure, you bet. Thank you for your time. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, As you just stated, I am chairman of the board of the Brown County Playhouse Management. We are a 501c3 corporation. The good news is we inherited the Playhouse about seven years ago from Indiana University. There's a lot of history in that building. The original Playhouse was built in 1949. The first play presented in that Playhouse was a play called The Old Soak. And if you kind of listen to the title, you can imagine what it's about. Jack Rogers, who happens to be Andy Rogers' father, along with Indiana University, decided to, to, to build a theater. The original building was actually an old barn, which was the stage, and then the audience sat underneath a tent, which worked out all right until it rained, and then they had problems. They also had problems with a local potter that the the, the sparks from his uh, workmanship would burn a hole in in the tent, and then they would uh, have concern about the rain. At the time, it only seated about 300. Cost to Bill was only $10,000. And actually, Andy's dad and some other people paid for it, and within two years, that $10,000 was paid off. So you can see it was a pretty successful uh, from the get-go. Tickets were $9.90 back then. Uh, There was no restrooms, of course, in the tent or in the barn. However, thanks to uh, Andy, every program would say, if you need to use a restroom, go across the street to the Ordinary or the Nashville House. The problem being with that, both of those restaurants closed at 7. So if you were in the theater and had to go to the bathroom, you had a major problem. In uh, 1977... Andy Rogers got together with a gentleman at IU called Keith Michaels, and they decided to build a a better and a bigger playhouse. That playhouse was built in 1977 at a cost of about $300,000. One of the main contributors was Herman Wells, 
president at the IU at the time, and of course the IU Foundation. Unfortunately, uh, IU made the decision in 2010 to take a break and close it. Financially, it was a burden on them. They were doing about three or four plays during a season there. So anyway, they closed it. Uh, we decided as a community that we could not lose the Playhouse. We'd already lost Ski World. We'd already lost the Opry. And there was no way that we were going to lose the Playhouse. So the foundation, the uh, Brown County Foundation, stepped up and formed a committee and started negotiating with IU, a foundation. And it took us about six months that IU said, okay, you can have it, providing that there's certain guidelines as far as a financial obligation, uh, which we met. And in early 2011, it was the keys were presented to a, a, a 501c3, as I said, uh, the Brown County Playhouse. And the rest is history, and we've been fairly successful. We're going on next year. We will start our uh, eighth year. The bad news is it eats a lot of money. Productions are very expensive in there. The, the, the building itself is becoming aged. There are four huge air conditioners on top, which we have problems with. And the problems with they don't make the parts anymore. So if they break down, we, we've got some problems. But we're working around those problems, and uh, we're doing all right. Well, I understand that you're uh, trying to raise some money right now with uh, the Be a Star program. You want to talk about that? Yeah, the, the board, when we look at our financials last year, we only raised in our total budget about 17% of our financing came from donations. After really looking at other theaters our size, most theaters our size being about 400 seats, we have to raise 45% of our expenses in donations. So you can see we were way behind. So the board decided to have a program called Be a Star in the Playhouse. Uh, we went to the merchants. We went to the lodging. We went to uh, a lot of the government identities, the town, uh, the county. So we are in the process of raising some money, and I will tell you it's going very well, thanks thank to the community. It's going very well. Well, that's really good news because I am a huge fan of the Playhouse. It's a wonderful venue to see a movie or a play or hear a musical group or any of those things. Uh, Bob, is there a way to get a hold of you guys? Do you have a website or a Facebook sure. page? Sure. Uh, excuse me. It's www.browncountyplayhouse.org. You can actually buy tickets online. So, yeah, there's plenty of opportunities to get on. All of our programming is on our website. The interesting about a playhouse like we're running, we have to book performances about six to eight months in advance. So we're setting here in 2018. Uh, we're probably about 80% already booked with the live performances for 2019. So you really have to keep on top of who's coming close to you or who's coming near to you to, to, to book them in advance. Well, this is all really great news, Bob, and thank you so much for coming in and sharing this information. No, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. The song I'm going to play for you now is a tune I wrote called Me and My Traveling Gal. About two years ago, my wife and I bought a van and converted it into an RV and uh, lived in it for about three months or so. So this is sort of a reflection upon that time. Goodbye, we're leaving you behind To a land some may you never see We'll try to write the sometime And we hope that you will write to we Write your letter, sign it good Put the postage where you should What's the address you might say Superhighway USA We go east, we go west We go wherever place is the best Just me and my traveling guy This place will open up your mind See the world 
from a different point of view This land is yours, this land is mine Don't forget this idea, it isn't new We just want to see the world Before the rest of life unfurls Take my advice and give her a ring Buy a van and sell everything We go east, we go west We go wherever place is the best Just me and my traveling guy Mountains, canyons, and rivers wide Snowy peaks, sandy beaches too Don't forget that wildflower sunrise And the waters, turquoise and the blue Every night we would stay Out underneath the Milky Way Have a drink and write a verse To contemplate the universe We go east, we go west We go wherever place is the best Just me and my traveling guy Goodbye Flower sunshine I'm going back to the way things used to be Hope to get back out there sometime But for now we'll out just ride to the Write my song, it's a pretty good Put the hook right where it should No need for me to wait and see If you come along again with me We go east, we go west We go wherever place is the best Just me and my travel And we go east, we go west We go wherever place is the best Just me pause for station identification. You are listening to the Brown County Hour on Volunteer Powered Community Radio, WFHB at 100.7 in Brown County, 91.3 and 98.1 in Bloomington, 106.3 at Ellettsville, and online at wfhb.org. The final segment begins with Jennifer Buby, who was this year's Brown County Fair Queen. Chuck Wills has an essay about his truck, and Dave Seastrom shares a few words about reincarnation. We'll close the show with Chris Dollar's tune, It's Okay, It's All Right. It is my pleasure to have uh, Jennifer Buby in the uh, (laughs) studio this evening, and Jennifer just became Brown County Fair Queen. Here is a little thing that she put together that uh, was printed in the Democrat, listing some of her achievements and accomplishments. School and work. Homeschool graduate. Ivy Tech Community College graduate. Magna cum laude. Majoring in visual communications. Currently serving as a Lilly Endowment intern for the Brown County Community Foundation. Formerly served as intern at the White House in Washington, D.C., launched her own freelance design and writing services professionally and philanthropically to groups, businesses, and individuals. 
And um, you're 19, right? Just turned 20, actually. <laughs> Just? But you were, in fact, 19 when all of this was... Yes, that okay. is true. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, you know, well, I saw that in the paper and I thought, well, you know, we actually have interviewed you before on behalf of sure. the Community Foundation, mm-hmm. which uh, I understand that you're you're still there and your position has shifted somewhat. You want to talk about that a little bit? Oh, absolutely. I, I love to talk about my work at the foundation. So as soon as I returned back from my little venture in D.C., I reached back out to my former employer at the foundation, just to kind of check in because we are celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. So I want to check back in on some of the projects that we had started before I left the year before and see how things were doing, how the excitement was in the community. And he said, hey, you know, we could really use you on a couple of initiatives and projects that we're working on right now. And so all thanks to our now former CEO, Larry, I was able to help with a few marketing initiatives uh, with different organizations here in the community, as well as helping put together our 25th anniversary gala, which just happened this past weekend. So. So is there a future for you with the foundation? I hope so. If not in a professional sphere, at least in in a volunteer manner, I've really come to love our community foundation. I was formerly a scholarship recipient through them back during my high school days. And at that time, as a youngin, receiving that kind of response and support back from your community, that, that meant a lot to me. I was really grateful for that. But then later on, when I came to actually work with them and get to know the people that really brought the foundation together and helped sustain our community, the many different facets in which our foundation was really integrated in Brown County. I was surprised and excited and delighted, and it's really come to make me love this community and this county even more than I had before. So yes, I do hope that when my time at the foundation may come to a close here as as work, that that's not goodbye for forever. Well, uh, I'm sure the community <laughs> would miss you terribly if you decided to do something else. <laughs> um, all right, so I have to ask about a couple. Elephant in the room, no sure. pun intended, okay, uh, absolutely. would be uh, having served in the White House as an <laughs> intern. Mm-hmm. So I, I have a bunch of questions about that. Sorry. First of all, <laughs> where do you live? I mean, do they have special housing for you in Washington, D.C.? Part of your responsibility and part of the fun getting to be an intern there in the White House uh, was finding your housing, especially because a lot of the students were drawn from all across our nation. It was kind of a, an interesting yet exciting endeavor for us to be jumping on the Internet or calling up places and researching what would be good housing and also sort of juggling the transportation system out there. That was kind of fun yeah, and DC definitely is, new for uh, me. <laughs> D.C. is a pretty crowded town. It really uh, is. I would think housing would be a challenge there. <laughs> definitely compared to here in, in beautiful Brown County. All right. So um, did you get to meet the president? I did, in fact. And it, it was quite exciting. We even got to have our photograph taken with him, which yeah. is still, my father helped me frame it, and it's still hanging on my wall back at home. D.C. is a, an amazing city with all of the memorials and all of the monuments. And Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, it's an impossible to city to drive around in. So mm-hmm. did you have a car? Did you rent a car? Is that how I, you did? I did not, actually. My family was able to drive me out and then kind of tote me back when I was ready to come home. There were taxis all around and then the metro system. So all of so that So you didn't was... Uber anywhere then? I actually had some drivers will deliver food to oh. wherever you're staying. Well, there's no kind of shortage exciting. of restaurants in Washington, <laughs> D.C. That is for sure. Well, what an experience. So... Your own freelance design and writing services. Mm-hmm. You want to talk Absolutely. about that real quickly? Sure. I would love to. So in graphic design or in wordsmithing, as I've done before, it kind of started out as a side hobby for me. Just little things here and there where people would say, hey, you know, we really need help designing a poster. Or our person that usually does our website is leaving. Do you think you could maybe tinker with it? And I realized quickly that, that I loved it. And not only did I love it, but it was something that I was able to find some skill in. And with my degree in visual communications, many of those classes really helped me out in pursuing that and kind of honing my craft. And... Here I am now. Jennifer, this is an amazing list of accomplishments. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, uh, Jennifer Buby, White House intern, uh, <laughs> community foundation, personal business, uh, master gunsmith. Thank you so much for coming in. It's been my pleasure. Thank you all. 
I have embraced woodland life in many ways since moving to Brown County. In some ways, I've really personified the stereotype. I chop my own wood, hunt mushrooms, drive a tractor. I even own a pickup truck. I've had several, actually, and as my wife says, my life seems somehow incomplete unless I have some pile of junk to work on in hopes of a mechanical resurrection of some kind. Even though my day job is fairly technical, my heart is at its fullest when I'm driving around in something that I can fix with a hammer and baling wire. I have a certain appreciation for crank-up windows and manual transmissions. My favorite beater was an old F-150 from the previous century with a great throbbing inline-six engine that I'm proud to say was often installed in school buses and dump trucks. A rolling dose of woodland testosterone, and I could fix it with my Leatherman tool. I know, because I did. A lot. Well, things transpired as they often do, and it was time for dear wife to get a new vehicle. I'm not sure how it happened because it all occurred so quickly, but we went to the dealer in the old Ford and came home in a new Ram. My bride was thrilled, and I was a little disoriented. The truck had everything. Power windows, a heated steering wheel, a button that would raise the suspension up for more ground clearance. It even had a big screen on the dashboard that I swear would show YouTube videos. She was driving the future. I don't get to drive it too much as she's commandeered it with all of her stuff. Kid car seats, insulated bags, boxes of tissues, and various implements of shopping destruction. But I'm happy that she's happy. Though, I do miss my beater truck, and here's why. Last Sunday, I had to deliver a big tent to a friend in town. It only made sense to load it into the truck since that's what it's made for. I loaded her up, jumped in with the keys, and was immediately disoriented. I'm used to twisting an ignition key, and this has a big start button that you push. So after following the appropriate launch procedure, as directed on the mission control screen, I got a message, key fob battery low. I can change that later, right? Right. So I went on my way and made my delivery to the delight of my friend, and you can guess what happened next. Upon preparing to launch for my return trip home, the big screen told me, key fob not detected. It was right there in my hand, but no amount of pleading and button punching would convince the truck from the future that I was authorized to make it go. Now this was a first. I've run out of gas, I've run out of air in the tires, even run out of antifreeze, but I've never run out of ignition key before. It's almost as insulting as running down a battery-powered book But that's another story for another day. Being resourceful, I pried open the key fob and walked across the street to the drugstore to get a new battery. Problem solved. On my walk, I also had plenty of time to consider investing in the battery business, since every new car runs on these blasted coin-shaped things these days. But I digress. Once back to the truck, I opened up the battery package. Or, more accurately, I tried to. That blister pack was made of some super plastic that was hermetically sealed on all sides. Safety sealed for your protection should have been the warning. I tugged, I tore, I even chewed on that package. Here I was in this rocket-powered truck surrounded by Uber technology that lets me tune the radio by voice command, and I couldn't start the blasted thing because I needed a Stone Age tool to break open the battery packaging. I didn't think I needed the Leatherman tool to fix the new Uber truck. It was sitting home in my little travel toolkit, as it is allegedly unnecessary on these new vehicles. Well, eventually the packaging relented, and needless to say, I was late getting home. When I got there and explained what happened, dear wife said, Honey, the truck should have told you about the battery so you could change it before you left the house. Yes, baby, the truck told me. It looks like even the new truck thinks that I need to be a better listener. So, let my misadventure be a lesson to us all. You can take the boy out of the woods, but you should never let him take the Leatherman out of his pocket. This has been a big week in my life. Seven days ago, my mom passed away after a long illness, and I've spent the last several days settling her affairs and working on a memorial. Funerals could be a big deal or not, but in rural America, and certainly in Brown County, we favor the big send-off. Friends gather in a large hall, kind words are spoken, and often there's a big meal that follows. Sometimes the service is religious, and sometimes it's not. But in whatever form it takes, love for the deceased is expressed and shared amongst the participants. 
No matter how meager the family's resources might be, no expense is spared for the final expression of love and devotion for the dearly departed. Things have changed as country folk have become more citified, but going back several generations, typically the largest and most impressive structure in almost every small hamlet and burg was the funeral parlor. And more often than not, the undertaker was the wealthiest man in town. This was surely true in Nashville back when Earl Bond and his father before him, Joshua, took care of our dead. There was a famous quote attributed to Joshua that illustrates my point. One more funeral and Mabel is going to college. I'm not criticizing the Bonds or anyone else in the funeral business. I'm simply pointing out that in poor rural America, there were no jobs per se, and often the undertaker was the only one who had constant employment. I've been thinking about my place in the scheme of things, and more than once in the last several weeks, I've contemplated my own mortality. I'm a huge fan of cowboy poetry, and I thought I would share one of my favorites that I think describes a whole lot of my friends, and most of all, me. It's called Reincarnation. Reincarnation by Wallace McRae. What does reincarnation mean? A cowpoke asked his friend. His pal replied, it happens when your life has reached its end. They comb your hair and wash your neck and clean your fingernails and lay you in a padded box away from life's travails. The box in you goes in a hole that's been dug into the ground. Reincarnation starts in when you're planted neath a mound. Them clods melt down just like your box and you who is inside And then you're just beginning on your transformation ride. In a while, the grass will grow upon your rendered mound. Till someday, on your moldered grave, a lonely flower is found. And say a hoss should wander by and graze upon this flower. That once was you, but now's become your vegetative bower. The posy that the hoss done ate, with his other feed, makes bone and fat and muscle essential to the steed. But some is left that he can't use, and so it passes through, and finally lays upon the ground this thing that once was you. Then say, by chance, I wanders by and sees this upon the ground, and I ponders and I wonders at this object that I found. I think of reincarnation, of life and death and such, and come away concluding, Slim, you ain't changed all that much. My mom had a great sense of humor, and I know she would laugh at the sentiment in this poem, but for all the right reasons, I'm not including it in my eulogy for her. But you know, it just might be perfect in mine. This is Dave Seastrom. See you next time. It's alright, don't tell you the hurt.
lots of pressure. It's all right to shave with heavy cream. Thanks for tuning in to episode 80 of the Brown County Hour, recorded in our studio at the History Center here in downtown Nashville and brought to you the first Sunday of every month at 9 a.m. and the following Wednesday at 6 p.m. The Brown County Hour is brought to you by a diverse group of folks who believe now more than ever that the world is for everyone. This show was produced by Chuck Wills, Pam Rader, Rick Fettig, Vera Grubbs, Jim Lemon, and Dave Seastrom. We would also like to thank Slats Klug for our theme music. You have been listening to the Brown County Hour. Coming to you from deep in the woods of Brown County, Indiana. Celebrating the arts, culture, and nature that make this such a unique community. Visit us online at browncountyhour.com. The Brown County Hour is a production of WFHB. Volunteer-powered, listener-supported community radio for South Central Indiana. Take me back, back to my home, Brown County home.